Bonjour Paris. Uh, it is fantastic to be here in Paris. So thank you for listening. So today I'm going to talk to you about BFFs for Swift and how you can use them in your iOS apps to dramatically improve the complexity of your apps and speed up your development. But before we get into how BFFs work or what even they are, we need to take a step back. So a lot of apps come from a kind of legacy background. And most of you will have a scenario like this. You have some sort of general purpose API that's been around for a while. And when it was first created, it had a single client. Maybe a web client, but it could be any kind of other client. And then as time went on, we added more and more clients. So we'll add an iOS app and an Android app, all using the same general purpose API. And then as time went on again, we might add even more clients, like a mobile web client, maybe even a TV client. And then there might even be third-party services using your API to uh, interact with your services and your backend. And they're all using the same API, which leaves you in this kind of situation, where the API, API really isn't fit for purpose. Different clients have got different needs. So for instance, if you're writing an e-commerce app or a shopping app on the desktop, you might want to display all of the different products you have. But on a mobile client, you have very limited space. So you might want to have a barcode scanner to scan the barcodes and find the product. And they're very different use cases that the API needs to be able to account for both. But it doesn't stop there. A lot of backends these days and companies these days are moving from monolithic backends to microservices. So your iOS app might be talking to its backend quite happily. And then at some point, your backend team go, we're doing this microservices thing. We're going to split out some functionality into a separate microservice. So you need to then update your app call that microservice instead, go through the App Store review process, and then your team do it for all the different parts of your app, and you have all these different microservices that you need to manage. And you have tens and tens of endpoints that you might need to track and changes and keep updated. And we haven't even talked about calling third-party APIs. Maybe you're using AWS functionality or Google functionality. Maybe you're calling a weather API to find out what the current weather is. And you have to manage all of these and manage the credentials for all these and keep them secure which can leave you as a developer feeling slightly confused because you have this really complicated app. And even if you've solved all of that, we have something that I call the home screen problem. And this is the, th the thing I see the most when talking to companies and going into companies. Most APIs will be some sort of REST API. So if we're writing a conference app that say to find all the conferences around us and what's on next, we'll have an events endpoint, we'll have an endpoint for uh, locations, we'll have an endpoint for the schedule, we'll have an endpoint for the speakers. And we need to manage all of these different endpoints. So let's go into detail and imagine our conference app. So on our home screen, we're going to display the conferences that are coming up uh, and let's say a picture, where it is, and the, either the talk that's currently on or the next talk on. So we'll make a request to our events endpoint API of the coming up. API, and this gives us some pagination information, like so we can keep scrolling. But it's returning 100 events because that works on web. But on mobile, we're only really going to show two or three at a time. And so we're downloading all these events that we're not really going to use. And then we have our events array. And this has loads of information that every client might possibly ever want. And we have a list of speakers that we're not going to use. We have some dates, which is great. And then we have this location, which has a latitude and longitude because the web client has a map to show. But on the iOS app, you're probably not going to show that until you go into the detail screen. So it's like, OK, right, I'll make a request to the location API. And I get the name and address, which is actually what I want. But I'm also pulling down things like the nearest stations, any good public transport information, all this information I don't need. And then to find the event, the talk that's either currently on or is coming up next, you need to make a request to the schedule API. OK, so we make a request to the schedule API for that event, for that conference. And this gives us an array of talks. And we have to loop through each one, find out which one is either currently on or going to be on next. And that's awesome. We have some dates. We can do that. But the speaker is just an ID string, because that speaker might be talking at lots of different conferences or doing a workshop and a talk. So you then have to go make a request to the speaker API, finally, to go and get the information for that speaker. And you get the name, which is all you want. But you also get information like the profile image, the biography, a load of text, GitHub and Twitter um, handles, all this information you're not going to use. And so for us to populate our home screen, we're making four, 500 network requests 
just to fill up our home screen. When all we really wanted was to make one request to our backend to get some pagination information so we can keep scrolling nice and smooth, and an array of events with just the information we need. We then also have the problem where different teams manage different parts. So the iOS team generally build the iOS app, and then the API team will be the, build the API app. And that API team might be in a different office. They might even be in a different city or even country if you're in a, working for a bigger organization. So there's a big barrier to communication there on how you get your APIs working together. And how many of you have been in a situation where you've asked your backend team for a feature, and it's, sure, submit a Jira ticket. We'll get around to it at some point in the future. And it could be weeks or even months before that even gets prioritized. And they have to weigh up the priorities of all their different clients to work out what they're going to implement. So it just slows you down as developers, which leaves you feeling, well, kind of like that. But for your users, if we go back to the number of requests we're making, you have to make hundreds of requests just to populate the home screen of your application, which has uh, implications for things like memory management. If you're downloading all this information you don't actually need, and what about battery life? And we're assuming that your users here are going to be on good internet connections. But we know that's not the case, especially on cellular. If you're lucky, your user might have 3G, but they might even have Edge instead of 4G. And so it can just take time for them to be able to use your, your application. So the solution to all this is the BFF, which is the back end for a front end. And this was a pattern introduced in around about 2015 by a company called ThoughtWorks. And it kind of builds upon the concepts of API gateways or proxies. And so the idea is instead of your iOS app here calling different microservices or different general purpose APIs, weather APIs, et cetera, et cetera, and having to parse all that data and filter it all out and work out what you actually need, is you insert a BFF in between your iOS app and those services. And this is a separate backend specifically for the needs of your client. And it allows your client to have much more simple, simpler network uh, interactions which allows you to update and develop your application quickly, because you can push all the complicated logic into a BFF, which is something that you can update easily, because it doesn't have to go through the App Store review process. You can put it in a data center or an availability zone right next to all those other microservices and make those 400 network calls you need really, really quick. And the slow connection between the device and the BFF only has to make one network call and downloads only the information it needs. So if we go back to our example of the conference app, our BFF can just return the data we need in one single GET request to populate the home screen, which is going to have a, a great improvements for your users when they're using your application. So what you basically end up with is you have a load of microservices or APIs or third-party services that you're using. And then you have an iOS app with its own backend for front-end that calls all these different services. You might have an Android app that has its own backend for front-end that calls all these different services, and a web client app that has its own backend that calls all these different services, and so on. And it's really important that the API team can keep maintaining and building and owning those different services, but it's the iOS team that builds and maintains the iOS BFF. It's the Android team that builds and maintains the Android backend for front-end, and it's the web team that builds and maintains the web client, BFF, and so on. And this is really important because if you don't do this and it's the back-end team who are building your BFF, you're back in the situation where you were before where they have all this other work to prioritize instead. So Sam Newman, who uh, introduced this concept uh, from ThoughtWorks, said the BFF is tightly coupled to a specific user experience. So this means that any kind of client has its own BFF, and this allows you to make the API very coupled to your client and your UI. So your, your API only returns what your UI needs, and it makes it very specific. And by building and maintaining it in the same team, it allows you to move um, quicker and adapt quicker to your uh, business needs. So some examples of this, I mentioned ThoughtWorks, uh, the company that introduced this, and they first did this with SoundCloud. So SoundCloud had hundreds and hundreds of different services when they moved from a big monolithic app to microservices, and they had hundreds and hundreds of clients. They had iOS apps and Android apps, they had web, uh, websites, and they also had lots of third-party services as well, like record labels calling their API. And so what they did is they split out all these different services, uh, all these different clients, to have their own BFF, which allowed them to move and adapt much quicker. And Netflix are another famous example of using BFFs. So every single Netflix client, 
whether that's the Xbox app, whether that's the PS4 app, whether that's the iOS app or the website, they all, all have their own individual BFF, which returns the data that that client needs and nothing more. So if you're going to go and build a BFF in your iOS team, you need to pick a language. Well, the obvious answer is Swift, and using Swift on the back end. Now, I could talk about how companies like Allegro are seeing huge performance benefits from moving some of their processing stuff from Java to Swift. I could talk about how ING and Fin are processing financial transactions and sending and receiving money using Swift on the server. Or I could talk about how Amazon use Swift on the server with their Prime Video uh, product. So if you've ever watched a video on Amazon Prime, it's gone through a server-side Swift application. But I'm not going to. I could also talk about how the question of whether it's ready for production is one that we really don't need to answer anymore, because it's a null question. But what I actually want to talk to you about using Swift on the server for your BFFs is two things that will make your life easier as developers. And the first is context switching. So we've all been there as developers, where we've had to be working on a ticket, and the product owner has come over and said, I need you to pick up something else because we have a bug. And you go, OK, go, go and pick that thing up. And then you come back to your ticket hours or days later, and you just can't remember what was going on. And it takes you a while to get your mindset back into that frame. And that's using the same language and the same app. So with using Swift, you get to keep the same language. First off, you don't have to teach your iOS team a brand new language and upskill the entire team when they already know Swift well, and you don't have to change languages to be able to write your backend. You get to use Xcode and the developing tools that you already know and know how to use. So if you know how to build an iOS application for Mac OS uh, or iOS, then you know how to build a, a start building a, a backend in Swift for the server. And you also get things like debugging support and a compiler that will tell you what you have errors in your code before you ship it to production, which will blow web developers' minds. And the second thing I want to talk to you about by using Swift on the server is the ability to share code. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room has had the case where they're using some sort of API, and you go and get the date from that API, and it is in some crazy unknown format because they've invented their own standard and you have to write a custom date formatter. And then they change it at some point in the future, and you have to release an update to your iOS app. But by sharing code in the server, what you can actually do is create a shared model package that contains all of the different models that your backend for frontend will send and receive. And you can share that using Swift Package Manager in your iOS app and your backend for frontend. And this becomes the single source of truth for all your models. So if you make an update to your model, then it gets updated in both the different apps. And you don't have to worry about typos. You don't have to worry about using the same types, because it's all the same language. And this is especially important when it comes to things like dates. So if we go back to the example of our conference app, we have this code that we actually just want to return. So we can just create a codable struct that matches that content and that type. So we have some pagination information that contains a URL, because why bother sending it as a string when we can let Foundation do the hard work of converting it back to a URL? And then we have an array of events. And these events, events have things like dates, because we don't need to write custom date formatters or any kind of date formatter, because it's just using Foundation and JSON encoder and JSON decoder at both ends of the package. So you don't, really don't care how this gets sent. It could be sent by JSON. It could be sent by form URL encoding. You could even use things like protobuf. But because it's codable and you're using it on both ends with the same code, it doesn't matter what the transfer format is. So to recap, backends for front ends allow you as developers to move all of the complex logic for networking out of your app into a separate contained application that you can update easily and frequently without having to go through the app store review process and something that you can control which allows you to give your users much better experience because you're only getting the information that you need from your iOS app. And finally, by using Swift on the server, you get all the benefits of not having to context switch or learn a new language and the ability to share code, which will make your lives as developers much more productive. Thank you.